my friends I am Gosha from Cosmic Agency and today I am in a very snowy location it's sunrise that's right it's very early in the morning well very early it's around 9 in the morning actually 9 30 is where the sunrise comes up and I'm in this incredible location where everything is white it's like minus 15 Celsius and I just had to come here and see this incredible scenery and with that I want to introduce these two incredible videos that are going to present that I'm going to present now with this one being the first video and then the second one will be a follow-up and this is information from Yaski metaphysical information incredible information uh, try to watch it or read it carefully as there is a lot of really very important and useful information and it started with the Robert's question actually when he was talking when he was asking asking about where do the Tigetans who live in Tageta go when they die like where where do they go I mean they all go to the same location I mean we all go to the same place somewhere in the universe but like do they go to the higher realms uh, because it was said that many Tigetan Pleiadians they do not choose to reincarnate they go to the higher realms what are these higher realms like? what is the existence there like? what is it like in those superior higher planes? and actually as he explains that they are not really superior planes and it will be understood she also goes into into what death is like and why there is no death why there is no death but you have to understand this is all viewed from various platforms and points of view so from one point of view there is death from another there isn't and she's explaining why from her view and how she experiences reality there is no death not only that there is no densities there are no densities there are no parallel universes and there is no material world she's also explaining why the term of ascended masters really isn't valid from her perspective so this is going to be packed with with good metaphysical teachings and I want you to stay tuned for the next video which will be a follow-up of this one so enjoy it originally in Spanish asks Robert and where do these Tigetan souls that do not want to be in the physical go? It's just that it is no longer a place to go. In those planes, there applies already a principle of non-locality. They can only prefer to be half in the physical in some places more than others. Places from the point of view of someone with a body. They are higher planes from the point of view of the physical, but they are not higher. That is something else that is not well described. They are not even different. It is the same plane that expands more and more. Those planes are not anywhere, but they are among this one, mixed in as part of it. They are always here with that more expanded mentality. Where are those planes? Answer is here. Wherever you are, it is always here. It is like living in your imagination as something totally real. Whatever you imagine has your attention and that's what you live. So you don't travel. You just imagine being on Earth, and you are. Then you imagine being on Era, and you are. Era in harsh winter. You live it, because that's what you see, because that's what you imagine. And what you imagine is 
and that's reality. And then you switch to Erra in spring, and that's it. It is spring. If you imagine nightmares, you will have them. If you don't, if you don't want them, you won't have them, but you know them. But you do not limit yourself to imagine normal things from the point of view of planes with bodies, of the so-called dense ones. Already in that state, you imagine inconceivable things, impossible to describe of what would be called higher planes. But as I said, they are not higher. They are only more expanded, but the same. Swimming among cosmic fish, among nebulae and stars, swimming in love, in ideas, swimming in creative potential. You are mind there. You only have a body when you imagine it. Only because that is what you want to imagine. If you don't want to, you are just mind, pure consciousness. You are your imagination and what you create. You are not something that creates something else. You are simply what you create, and you live what you are because you live what you create. And that includes bodies. Bodies that, as you imagine them, you call that incarnation. And you imagine that you are trapped in a body for the duration of an incarnation. But that is illusory. It is also your creation, your ideas. There is only mind. From those planes, yes, you know. And you do not follow linear incarnations, only your ideas. And nothing limits you. You imagine yourself to be billions and billions of creatures, all you, simultaneously. Everything nourishes you. Everything is your lucid dream. Asks Robert. But from those planes, you mean you know you are the all, then you are the source. Yes, you just swim in your ideas, and there is no limit to your mind, to your thinking capacity, so you imagine anything and everything together. Comments Robert. And what's on your inside you reflected to the outside as your creation, of course. That's why there is no one above or below you. It is you and only you. You already understand everything. You already know everything. Yet, that's why you create combinations of what you know. And with that, you imagine more things. And more combinations that open more combinations of what you know and imagine. And with that, you entertain yourself. Playing, being your ideas. There is no loneliness. You are not accompanied. You are neither male nor female. All together, yes. Understanding everything. Being everything. You understand duality as a functioning of the same thought process, as well as time. But you experience multiple times. Asks Robert. But one thing. If source is only one, and integration is the ultimate expression, so to speak, isn't the source alone? Or that no longer applies? No, it knows it is one, but it integrates everything in such a way that there is no concept of solitude, no concept of companionship, only in what it imagines. For example, when you die, you experience an integration, a dissolution back to the field 
where the I, the ego, ceases to be and dissolves in a sea of liquid ether. You cease to be what you were because you dissolve with everything else. From the point of view of someone alive, that is terrifying because you cease to exist as such. It is seen as destruction of the ego, of the self. And it is true, but only from the point of view of someone alive. Because that dissolution of the ego, what is dissolved and interpreted as destruction, is also pure love. What many people with near-death experiences describe as being surrounded by pure love which is a very beautiful experience that they regret leaving behind to return to their incarnation because they were brought back to life in an operating room. It is the same thing. That destruction of the self, interpreted by the point of view of the attachments to who one is. That is what is scary. But from the other side of death, that destruction of the self is the integration into the etheric field of what has always been. The love that everyone sees or feels at death is that destruction or integration into the field. So that is only scary as long as you are alive. After that, it is not. Ergo, why fear death if you are alive? Because on the other side, what you interpret here as destruction, there it is integration and a great love that invades you. You swim in that pure love, in unconditional acceptance. It is the attachment to the concept that you are someone and not someone else and therefore inadequate and seeking acceptance to feel more comfortable and to ensure the survival of the species, whether in a romantic context or simply for group or clan protection. Besides, you cannot destroy yourself as such because you become an idea in the field. You are always that idea. And from that idea in the field, you incarnate again according to the procession or direction of your ideas. Asks Robert. Great, thank you. A question from those who start listening to us. I know it is absurd, but it is important to see how you answer it. Everything is ideas, as you rightly say. We are the creators of everything. It is very clear to me. There goes the question. I have a clear answer because I don't believe in all that New Age nonsense. They say that there is a whole hierarchy, I don't know how to call it, angelic one, of masters, etc. But if you are the creator, those hierarchies do not exist, or at most, you are them, right? Taking away from all that, all the religious charge. It is only religion, New Testament mixed with the modern stuff, adapted to the mentality of people who claim to be awakening only to fall into more of the same. You can only be ascended in comparison to someone, and in that context, who is presenting that point of view is the one who uses that expression, ascended, or ergo, you are not. You insignificant little guy in comparison to the great O oh, ascended master. You, them. Pyramidal, earthly cabal, Vatican. These are not stellar concepts of beings from higher planes, 
for lack of better words. Because there are no higher planes, only more expanded ones, in the context that from that point of conscious attention, more is perceived and understood. But I would understand a human explanation to say that a Buddha, because there was more than one, is more ascended than a person bent on making money by stepping on others. From the explanatory point of view of someone on earth, it is still valid to use those points of comparison. But I should not use them, since my purpose is to give to understand how things are seen from those points that you call higher, where that being there is not being higher. Noting the very name of elevated with the letters L that correspond to deities in terms of etymologies. It is the same phoneme of Gabriel, of Raphael, of Asacel, which denotes that they are ascended archangels in these examples. That is to say, the concept of superiority, ergo of ascended masters, is only valid from the consciousness point of view of someone terrestrial with average understanding about these matters. But from above, it is perfectly understood, it is seen, it is perceived, that there is no superiority. So, even in my case, although it is hard for many to understand, I am no longer in the physical. I only show myself to be able to work here. Here I am seen as imposing, even egocentric, saying kind of things like that my mind and consciousness is in higher planes. But from my point of view, I am not lowering anyone, nor do I think I am superior to anyone. That is a reflection of the point of view and level of understanding of the people who say that, whether they are human or not. I am fully aware of this. That's why I am in a child girl's body. Because children are allowed to be egocentric. If I were Athena's age, I wouldn't be like that. I couldn't. I would be seen as unbearable, conceited. But if I wasn't here in some form, I mean with a body, I wouldn't be able to say these things. So you wouldn't have the point of view of someone who lives in what you call other planes. But that doesn't make me so different from the others either. Because that's exactly what all of you do too. Everyone being you. Because from the most expanded context, it is also you when you meet another person on a bicycle who goes the opposite way and makes you ring 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 with their little bell whether or not they have the same face as you or not, especially because you are of the same species. Therefore, you are close in mind and consciousness. That's why you coexist to a certain extent, at least in the physical illusion as on Earth. Mentally, you may be far apart, yet still family. Mirrors of one another, comments Robert. Right, where does one person begin and another end? We don't know. It's you again. Yes, we do know. There is no separation other than an idea to which you have attachments. another day. Starting from where we finished off before, 
as has been explained, there is no physical world, because everything emanates from the imagination of the source itself, which is each one of us. From our own unique and perfectly valid point of view, each person's point of consciousness is the whole, is the source. It's not that there are multiple sources manifesting in each person, but that each different person, or in appearance different from each other, from ourselves, is just another expression of the same, of us. Being that there is no time, being that it is only an illusion that is a part of consciousness itself. Without a time frame, there is no consciousness thought process. And without consciousness thought to reason it out, there is no time. For science, time is molecular motion as a form of measurement. Yet you are still thinking when you are observing an object in absolute cold at minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. There is no material world, no densities, no time, no distances, no primordial particles. Everything emanates from who gives it those values, from who comes up with those classifications. When one incarnates somewhere, one enters a state of apparent limitation, where the perception is centered on the you and the I, on seeing other things, with the concept of other than oneself. This is created by forgetting who we were before that incarnation, thereby creating a new identity upon entering the next one. Even with the stellar races that retain memory of who they were in their previous lives, an identity is retained, an ego, that transcends those incarnations, one after another as if they were one single life, the previous one defining the next, and so on. Yet another identity, another idea of the ego is formed in each such incarnation. But the basis that preserves and forms that ego or identity of the self is memory. If one enters an incarnation where one remembers little or nothing of the previous incarnation, one forms a concept or attachment to the current identity of the person, as if it were the only thing that exists. This also translates into the fear of death, of the destruction of the I, of the ego. This is the veil of oblivion of which so many speak. But it is not something mysterious or some machine that imposes an erasure of memory on souls before incarnating again, but a simple energetic process that is easy to understand. It is incompatibility of frequencies, where the memory that is in the etheric field, which is as a whole the source itself, is at a very high energetic frequency that is incompatible with the lower frequencies of a doughy existential realm such as the one lived on Earth. Incompatible frequencies do not match, do not tuning. The body is basically a receiver of etheric waves, as a radio stereo receiver receives from a station that transmits music. 
It is the very purpose of the body to be able to transmit as a modem a signal from the spiritual world to the material world using terms that I will dismantle below. What forms the material world is perception and it materializes from the point of observation of someone incarnated with the process already described which is that of the dynamics of manifestation where basically what receives attention will first take form as thought which is energy which then when maintained long enough and with the correct conceptual feed in the form of harmonics of a frequency produces something similar to what is described as standing waves which will create nodes and each node is a particle that forms atoms that in turn will form molecules that in turn will form living or non-living material things. From the most expanded point of view, everything material is consciousness, not only as a manifestation of someone else, as in a higher point of attention or density, but by itself is a consciousness. That is, a rock, a grain of sand, a molecule of whatever material, all are different expressions of consciousness, perfectly self-sustaining. The very concept of what is alive and what is not should be reviewed in this context, because even if it is not biological life, there is still consciousness of being. The clearest example is quartz. So the only thing that sustains the existence of the material world is the one who interprets it as such, who gives the contrast between the material world and the spiritual world, life and death, the observer consciousness. Things exist because we think them, and we think them giving them a value, value that changes with another person, with another point of attention, both being valid. My point here is that there is no material world. The material world is only the attachment to a set of beliefs and structures that justify with logic something as opposed to something else. That is, it is a set of perception ideas. And the one who imposes that point of view perception is the lens with which a consciousness observes and reasons what it observes. That lens is the biological material body in this case. It is designed to limit the perception of the point of conscious attention to only being able to perceive what the body can detect with its limited senses, compressing the observer into perceiving a reality limited by that body, which is basically the range of visible light. When the body fails, it ceases to have that lens. Therefore, the perception of the point of consciousness expands and begins to perceive more things than the body itself can detect as reality. From another, more expanded point of attention, everything is an idea. And the self, the ego, is the result of the ego's frame of limitation, 
And that is formed by attachment, which in turn is formed by memory, giving the illusion that a specific person is just a body. And to some extent it is, yes. His ego identity is usually tied only to the context of reality given to him by the filter with which he exists, his body. As your body vanishes, as it is destroyed, the context of the ego, I, is removed. And it is interpreted as death. But based on what was explained above, the body itself is another set of ideas of attachments to concepts that form a person and what defines him. There is no body. It is an idea. Death brings the destruction of the framework of attachments that defines a person, the I-ego. And, as said above, is defined as destruction, being that it is the return to the unified field outside the limitations of perception of the body lens. This gives terror to most, being that this incorporation into the etheric field is the dense and strong love and integration that many experience with their near-death experiences. When in life, a person is forming his self-concept, his ego and his self. He has an attachment to what his body has formed as reality. But his mind consciousness does not depend on his body. It only translates it into the so-called material world. So, at death, the person point of attention consciousness will keep his concept of self and all his beliefs. Yes, he expands his potential by returning to the etheric field, but the person himself and his attachments can dramatically limit this experience of reconnection to the whole. This causes him to take with him all of his values and his entire personality. Many people, when they die suddenly, do not yet realize that they are dead, which causes their mind consciousness to continue manifesting or translating a copy or carbon copy of the material world manifesting those ideas that compose it as another mirror world similar to the material one that remains more firm or more difficult to alter with thought because of its low vibrational nature, dense and doughy, although in the end it is the same. That is to say, the dead person with attachments to the material world will create an alternate world very similar and in some cases identical to the real material world he inhabited in life. This happens on the principle that the higher the density, the greater the speed and ease of manifesting thoughts and making them perceptibly real or seemingly outside our minds. It scales from the doughy material world as lived in a so-called 3D body on Earth as a means of slow manifestation to the immediate, as in the very high densities where what you think is simply reality. The denser, the slower this is giving the illusion that thought does not produce reality. The less dense, the more energy moving, the faster the manifestation, the more evident 
that thought is reality. So a person dies, takes the ideas he has with him. So he manifests a world around him that is compatible with those ideas, generated by those ideas. As every shared world is the result of having agreement of perception between individuals, the same happens in the world of the dead, where one or another soul will create with others a reality in and with which all are compatible in frequency of thought. Personal frequencies equals thought. With this, I try to explain how I see the dead creating their own world similar to that of the living, but with grim, different and changing attributes. Forming clans and alliances among themselves, forming another society with other rules similar to that of the world of the living, all as a consequence of agreement of perception among themselves, of those disembodied souls, combining the ideas they had in life with the new perceptions they have in this less dense mirror world. All this based on the concept that these souls, points of attention consciousness, have strong attachments to their ego, to their I, which will not easily accept their incorporation into the unified field, because they will see it as destruction of the self, what many discarnates take or perceive as the death of the dead. Again, this is just another illusion, because before being born, one already held an idea or concept of the self, which has been formed little by little from previous incarnations. So the return to the unified field is not a dissolution of the self, because the concept of identity, self, was held before birth and is held after re-entering the unified field. This using linear temporal concepts from the point of view of the observing person. If we add factors of non-temporality, it becomes even more evident that there can be no death. From the point of view of the unified field, ether or higher existential planes, same thing, time is only the result of local thought or self as a sequence of an idea. It is plastic, something controllable at will.